<laughs> hey guys, Marcus Brown, theflowpoint.com. This is podcast number one. I don't even know what we're going to call it yet. Um, I don't really know where it's going to go, but maybe nowhere, maybe somewhere. Who knows? It's kind of kind of depend on you guys. But in light of uh, all the time I spend in front of the computer working on Flowpoint episodes and, and otherwise, um, I'm starting off. Uh, on a completely different foot, really lo-fi here, uh, as you can tell. Not very polished. Um, Skype call with uh, my good friend, two-time world champion, five-time Masters champion, Will Asher. So, as you can see, uh, things are going to be a little different here in this corner of the website. And uh, hopefully it's going to be things that you guys can enjoy and, and things you guys can learn from. I'm trying to start, uh, you know, ask questions of guys like Will Asher and some future guests um, questions that are kind of basics that that the reasons behind they why they are the best that they are why they are you know a world champion or why they are successful in whatever endeavor it is that they do and I feel like those key questions might uh, be able to then be turned around and used by viewers like you to um, to maybe enhance your life or to be able to to learn from so that you can go out and do what you do better by listening to these guys and learning from osmosis. Exactly what I'm talking about, lo-fi. Phones are buzzing, tractors are running, but it's gonna be great. This is Will Asher, we're gonna get straight to it. Uh, thanks for checking in guys. Hopefully it's gonna get better and better. Don't be alarmed at the low quality at the moment. It's only gonna get better. Enjoy this one with Will Asher. This is the first time we've done anything like this. Maybe not the first time I've done anything like this, but this is the first flow point podcast. I don't know what I'm going to call it yet. That's how new this is, but I'm here with uh, a really good friend of mine, uh, a teammate at HO skis. He's going to help me kick off this first podcast. Couldn't be more excited to have a guy who's um, two time world champion. I was there for both of those. And I think five time masters, U S masters champion. Those are like I, the two, right Five times, two most prestigious events we have in the world. So, I'm here with Will Asher. Willie, what's going on, man? Tell me where you are and, and where where you're at in the in life right now. What's what's the deal? Where are we? Where where are we? Well, I'm currently. I'm in. I'm at home. I'm in Claremont, Florida. Um, yeah. Getting towards the, the end of this 2016 water ski season, which is pretty exciting. But um, yeah, right now we're just kind of getting geared up again. Got another event in two weeks, and that's kind of what's dominating the life right now. But it's all good. Tell me where we are. It looks like this could be kind of a semi like music video Apple commercial in the background. It's all white. <laughs> this, I'm just yeah, just in my house and in my kitchen slash living room slash. <laughs> to talk talk about you know, the event. You've you've been here, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a beautiful place. It's awesome, right on the lake. Um, talk real quick about the the next event you have coming up. You mentioned it. Um, what, what is that event and where is it? We have the U.S. Open. So it's in Okehili in West Palm Beach. And, and I think it's the end of September, yeah. And then that kind of rounds out the, the year for you as far as skiing? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, we last year we had the Worlds in December in, uh, I don't even remember where it was. but <laughs> Mexico. <I had> a, <laughs> Mexico, there you go. Yeah. It was, you know, it was, a pretty, it was a pretty long season and then straight back on and we got to Australia in, you know, February, March. So it's... <laughs> Ready for a break, you could say. Okay, talk real quick about that. Uh, a lot of people who may be beginner skiers or they're you know recreational, maybe tournament. There are some tournament skiers out there that are going to be listening, hopefully. But a lot of people don't necessarily know what your season looks like, like January mm -hmm. one to December thirty first. How much of those? How many of those months do you actually ski? Do you take some time off in the winter, or are you training like just as hard in November, December, January as you are? in June, July, you know, what does that look like for you? Yeah. Well, the way I do it, I mean, I, I pretty much take off. Well, my goal is normally kind of take off November, December, January, and like January, kind of getting geared back up, getting ready for the Australia stuff. Got a couple of events down there, but <laughs> ideally I'm trying to take six, eight weeks off yep. just, you know, that November, December kind of time, you know, do some fun stuff. Maybe I just go on a holiday without my water skis. <laughs> something like imagine that, that. But, <laughs> yeah imagine that i mean if I'm, I'm feeling super motivated or we um we're working on some exciting projects whether it's you know a ski project or a boat project or 
something else. And I definitely get motivated to ski in those off seasons. I'll just, you know, I'll just pick and choose my days. Living in Florida, some days it can be 80 degrees, some days it can be 40 degrees. So we just pick yep. and choose. Yep. Yeah. So, so there's no set, like strict schedule. You kind of just depend upon what you have going on development wise or body wise or weather wise. You kind of just allow yourself to, to fl go with the flow. Totally. I mean, you know, 10 months out of the year, we're pretty much forced. We've got to be on the water. We've got to be figuring some stuff out, skiing, getting strong, all that kind of stuff. But in those two months, I really just listen to my body. And if it says, hey, man, I want to go for a ski, I'll go for a ski. If it says, no, I want to sit on the couch and watch TV today, I'll, I'll kind of do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, not that every day is watching TV, but, it, you know, it does happen. When when I think of Will Asher, uh, I think when most people think of Will Asher, they don't think about sitting on the couch watching TV. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it do, it doesn't ha it doesn't happen very often. But, you know, it'll it'll happen every now and again. Hey, so uh, t talk let's talk real quick for people who may not know who you are. Um, who is Will Asher? Where the heck are you from? And why do people know your name in the sport of water skiing? Hmm, good question. My name is Will Asher. I'm 34 years old. I grew up in, um, well, I, I water ski grew up in Lincoln, England. I grew up in a little village called Heckington in England. That's where I was kind of spent the first 18 years of my life. And then um, that's kind of where it all started. My, my grandfather built a ski lake in 1982 or 84, something like that. And that's just where we spent all of our free time, you know, any summer holidays, any weekend holiday, stuff like that. We just were at the lake. My parents were super supportive. They saw the benefit of water skiing. They saw that it kind of kept me out of trouble and it gave me a, a passion or a direction for life. Mm. So it was, yeah, I was super lucky. That's where it started. Sure. What, what, what was the, was there a day or was there a year or like an event where you, something happened and you're like, I might want to try to be a pro skier. Like when did mm. that, when did that, when was that seed planted? I was growing up, I was pretty hidden because, you know, we're in England and it was a family deal and, you know, I didn't have much exposure to the outside. The internet wasn't really around. So I, I didn't know if I was good or I didn't know what I was. I just skied. So I, um, I'd say for one of the first times when I, I came to America when I was 16 and I, I got to ski with Andy and I was, you know, my ski broke and he's like, Hey, just try my ski. And I was 16 years old. And he's like, you know, your skis broke, just try mine. And I just went out there and I ran 39 back to back to back hmm. on his ski. I'm like, I don't know, is, is that pretty good? And he's like, give me that ski back. <laughs> <laughs> no, was, at, the time, at the time, it was pretty funny, but, you know, it, was, it took me a bunch of years after that to be able to run 39 because I didn't know how to set up my own equipment. I didn't know how, you know, he had obviously worked really hard to get to the position he was and figure out the stuff he had he had figured out to be able to run 39 at that time so he yeah. kind of gave me a glimpse he gave me a glimpse of you know my potential or what was actually possible or a feeling so that was, that was pretty cool and then i think just growing up and being exposed to it you 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 know you have victories or you you know you you get beat down you get back up and yeah. that just kind of happened over and over again so yeah. Fast forward from 16 years old to 34, and you probably are known as one of the one of the most successful, or maybe one of the the highest level like tinkerers or designers, ski designers in the industry. Just just all around athlete, and you know you know how to work on skis. You're you've been doing it for a long time, but when you're 16 and through your first couple of years skiing pro, what? Where was your mind? Were you worried about equipment? Were you thinking about how can I make my ski better? Or was it more like trying to work on your technique and your fundamentals? And, and like, so where was your focus? Because I know now it's, you're, tr you're trying to find balance uh, within the ski yeah. design and, and the like technical aspect, working on body, body fundamentals, body mechanics. But like, that's the first time I've heard you say that you jumped on Andy's ski Here's here's the guy who designed skis, and you're like, it took me a while to get back to that because he had his ski dialed. So yeah. when when was that? When did that? How that evolution go for you? To from from uh, skier to ski designer. It was it was pretty rocky because you know I, I got to I got to ride his ski and it was 
you know, it was pretty dialed. It was a couple of weeks before he went to Moonbury. He went to Moonbury, he won. He ran 39 a bunch of times. You know, that was back when it wasn't really happening. And, like, from that point, I'm like, oh, I guess that's how a water ski should feel. You know, it was kind of the end of the season. I didn't ski for the winter. I got back. You know, I bought the same ski that he had. I think it was like a, an O'Brien Maple ski or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, I was riding the 68, so I got the 68. But... Um, I guess the tinkering really started because my ski didn't feel anything like his ski. So it was like, okay, that from that's kind of, that, that's where it started. It's like, you know, I, I got to play with a fin or I got to, you know, I, I was buying skis, but I, I'd grind on the bevel or something. I'd ruin the ski, <laughs> but I'd still have to ski on it. Cause it's not like I have a company behind me that would, yeah. you know, support, support my filing habit. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, I guess, yeah. I mean, that, that's when it started. But when when did you when did you feel like okay, I can take a ski out of out of a mold or a production ski, and I can do things to make it better for me or better, hopefully not just for me, but for other people. That that didn't happen yeah. until more recently, and that's a that's it's, a skill that not a lot of people have. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of it's trial and error and just working through it. But you know, getting to work with Bob and with Dave and with yourself and kind of be able to talk to people about, you know, try certain things, have, have the opportunity to try stuff that works and stuff that doesn't work. And mm-hmm. then, you know, ultimately I, I kind of, over time I figured out what I like and what I don't like. Um, I don't, I don't know if there was one time where I was like, Oh, I think I got this figured out. Some days I feel like I'm doing pretty well. Other days I feel like I'm failing miserably, but <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's a process. It's fun. So for, for folks out there who may not know about, you know, how to set up their own ski, what would you say just the average ordinary guy, girl, uh, went to a boat show or, you know, went to a, an event or online and bought a ski and bindings. What's the number, what, what's the top two things that they should focus on as far as trying to get their ski somewhat dialed in? You know what I mean? Like, is it binding yeah. placement? Is it fin? Is it, you know, what, what, what is it? I think number one, you know, as soon as you get the ski out of the box, you want to try and find somebody. I'm, I'm sure your shop can help you, but just make sure the fin is stock, kind of stock settings. Yeah. You know, start from a baseline, start from somewhere. The, the factory's probably done a bit of testing and kind of gone with that. And then from there, I'd probably play with the bindings. I think the bindings is probably one of the easiest things, you know, go forward a hole, go back a hole, depending on what you're feeling. But so you, you, uh, you start you start messing with the fin, it can get a little bit tricky. <laughs> Chase your own tail. What what yeah. what kind of binding? What's the what's the uh, binding you're currently running right now? Um, I'm using the the new Syndicate hard shell binding just came out, and um, started getting a piece of that, and I'm I'm really excited that kind of Dave and the guys at HO have got that together, and that's going to be a really cool system. I'm really excited for it. We you and I have both been using that particular release system for a long time. I, I know I've been using yeah. it for 15 years. You've probably been using it for almost as long. 10, um, yeah. yeah. More, more specifically, um, what what's important to you as far as having a lot of guys are moving to a mm-hmm. rear rear kicker or rear toe mm-hmm. loop, I call it. Um, so yeah. a lot of people at the elite level, yourself, Andy Mapple, Nate Smith, um, a lot of the guys are kind of transitioning. Why, why do you think that's happening? And what advantages do you feel you have uh, with a single boot and then a rear kicker setup versus a standard double boot setup? Um, well, well, for me, it's just the the way I, I was always brought up. I had the rear toe loop. So, but over the years, I've kind of gone around and I've tried some double double binding setups, some double hard shell setups, and. For me, as soon as I jump on a double binding, I start to use more of my back foot. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I find I get away from the middle of the ski and I, I start relying on pushing on the back and I kind of lose control of the middle of the ski. And then I, I feel as soon as I get back on the kicker, I'm, I'm right back in the middle of the ski and where I want to be and kind of taking that power through the center and not necessarily on the, you know, oriented towards the back of the ski. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where, where, makes, yeah. Yeah, you're 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 able to f- to ride the ski more efficiently instead of stomping yeah. on the back. Yeah, I think it, you know if you're not stomping on the back, I think you're controlling load a little bit better, and I think that plays more into the you know the current setup we have with zero off and stuff yeah. like that. I think you can be a bit more fluid, a little less powerful. 
what is uh, what's the main thing if you want to talk or share? What's the main uh, like technical thing with your own st- skiing uh, right now that you're working on? Like one or two keys that you that you're kind of carrying with you when you go into each day training. I guess. I mean, I I was kind of talking. I think I was talking to you about this a couple of weeks ago, but it's I'm probably doing stuff now that I did when I first started skiing. So when I was eight years old, I probably had some something I'm still doing now, like yeah. where, where there's a hand position or something. So for me, it's just about, I've been trying to identify maybe some stuff I've always done and then just see if I can question those or, you know, test the hypothesis and then <clears throat> move on with something better. So yeah, for me, I've, I've been working on just how I get through the wakes, how I can get off the wakes. And if I cannot set myself up with, better direction, line control coming in to get a better result out of the turn. That's kind of been my focus. Do you, do you, do you have like one thing or a movement or a, a body part that you think about to make that happen? Or is it just more like a global like feeling approach to that section of the course? Uh, definitely global, but I, I mean, for me, it seems to be all coming from the hips. So mm-hmm. it's, I mean, it's kind of that old, old saying of you got to keep your hips up, got to keep engaged, yeah. but it really, you know, it keeps ringing true over and over again. For me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It it does. It's like, yeah, it's it seems to. It's like you know, the more you take a lot of load, and you can't keep your hips up, so then you got to maybe control the load better, or carry more speed, or mm-hmm. whatever it is to be able to create a load that you can hold and maintain to yeah. keep direction, keep speed, keep angle, that kind of stuff. Well, it's interesting to hear a lot of people. Uh, internet or otherwise talk about being stacked on a, on a water ski. And like I've talked about it before, I think you obviously are, are big on this. It's one of the things you, you do when you're skiing, when you're on, this is what you do better than almost anybody else in the world. If not the best is your hips, your shoulders, hips, knees, everything's stacked and perfectly in line. But it kind of, for me, I, when people ask, well, what, what do you mean by stacked? I don't know if it makes sense to you, but I equate it to like in the gym, like you CrossFit a bit. Yeah. If you have a barbell in your hands, imagine trying to hold the barbell bent over down by your knees for a minute versus holding the barbell, just standing vertical with the bar in the crease of your hips all the way yep. upright for a minute. Which one's going to be harder on your body and less efficient? Yep. You know, I think we know that intuitively, but unless you get like a picture or like a freeze frame in a video of, of yeah. yourself or, or a lot of people when they ski through the wakes, you notice like a lot of skiers end up in that kind of hunched forward, pulled out position. Handle, handle low. Yeah. 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 Handle low I mean, and it, out. It, it's hard. I mean, it happens so fast in the water. Sometimes you got to find something that's, you know, maybe a little slower pace. So yeah. maybe it's something in the gym or it's something as routine as carrying, carrying the grocery, you know, something yeah. But for me, it's, that definitely rings true and stacked. I, I think if you're stacked, it's like the handle is not very close to your knees. It's more close to your hips. Yep. So if you bend at the waist, the handle is going to creep down towards your knees. Whereas if you're stacked and your, your hips are over your feet or over your ankles, mm-hmm. then the, the handle is going to be a little close to your hips. Yeah. So it's just, um, it makes sense. You, you've done a bit of coaching this year. Right. I, I know you're in yeah. Colorado and you're quite a few places. What, what's like one or two like main uh, deficiencies that you see across the board in everybody's water skiing uh, when, you, when you're in yeah. the boat? Yeah, it's kind of, I think people like to get in that safety position. So it comes back to the hips are back and it's, it's almost like it's protecting your organs. You know, you're kind of in that crouched over fetal position, yeah. but you're on a ski. Yeah, I, I see that a lot. So it's like, okay, you got to try and keep the got to keep the handle high, keep it up on your hips, and then that way it kind of opens your chest and makes your spine more aligned. Yeah, you know, you have a straighter spine, not bent over. Yep. And then um, the biggest one is separation off the wakes. Hmm. So if if you cross the wakes and the handle starts to leave your body really soon, then you end up getting that down the line lack of direction. Yeah. Um, Which yeah. You know, those two kind of go hand in hand, I'd say. If you're not stacked coming into the wakes, when the load, when you want to release the load in a controlled fashion, your hips are already back. 
probably yeah. not going to go well. No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah everything's going to, you know, uh, everything's going to get outside the box. So yeah. it's like, for me, the longer you can keep everything inside of the box. So you've got a little box around your body. If you cross the wakes and the handle leaves your box, you're in trouble. Or if, you know, you, you come into the first wake and your ass gets behind, you're outside the box. You know, you got to keep everything this nice little wrapped up thing. What's, what's, <laughs> the, what's the best job you've done this year so far at keeping your crap inside the box? And where was that? What, what, what event or what training run was it? And, uh, and what did you end up running? Um, this is, I, I had a couple of good moments in the summer, I think. Um, I, I kept it pretty well in the box when I was in Australia for the Moomba. Oh, yeah. yep. that, was, um, that was kind of one of my big focuses was um, just being controlled through the wakes like really focusing on that alignment and keeping everything in shape. And then, um, at the masters as well, I thought I was, I did a pretty good job there. I was pretty happy with that. So let's talk real quick. Uh, those two events, uh, the Moomba masters in Australia is on the Yarra river. It's through the downtown area of Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, so it's, it's, cool. it's not, a, it, it's beautiful, but it's not as far as ski conditions go. It's variable. Like it's, yeah. it's what I think a lot of recreational and like, you know, club skiers on lakes and rivers across the world. It's kind of, kind of similar water to what they have. So there's maybe some current yeah. at, at masters yeah. in Callaway gardens. You can have the lake be pretty high. You can have it be pretty rolly, pretty movie. So those yeah. two events that you did really well at this year, what, what's your strategy going into that event, knowing that the conditions are a little challenging? Cause there's a lot of folks out there that may be listening someday that ski, every day or every couple times a week on challenging water that isn't a perfect man-made yeah. lake. So what kind of keys I, do you go into? I mean, the, the Australia one for me, it's been such a hit and miss tournament. I, it's just such a challenge for me. So I, this year I really went into it being aware of all the challenges. So it's, um, I find with those conditions, I've got to be aware of, you know, at the one end is a tight setup and there's more current because it's on a bend. And then mm -hmm. at one end there's more rollers when you, pull out for the, you know, I, I'm just like, I feel like my senses are super alert yeah. for, those, for that event. And then the same as the masters, you know, it's, you're, you're in a pretty cool setting, you know, some, yeah. some cool stuff going on. Um, I, I think it just like, for me, it's, it's being a, a proactive skier, not a reactive skier. So it's, it's making sure I've, you know, I'm setting myself up well in the gate. So I'm, I'm going to have good direction coming into one. I'm going to come out of one in decent shape. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's just writing the first paragraph really well. And then it seems to flow after that. You know, <laughs> are, yeah. are, are you a writer? Do you write much? <laughs> Not at all. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the worst English speaking, writing English person. In the world. <laughs> well, you guys do pronounce everything wrong, but that's besides. Yeah. That. <laughs> hey, that's funny. so, so speaking of talking, what, let's backtrack to a main event like Moomba masters going into the finals or the U S masters or world championships. When you're, when it's the day of the event and you're meant to ski your event starting, you're going to ski it in an hour or two. What does your preparation and self-talk look like, you know, going up to that event and that performance? What, what, what kind of rituals do you have that get you in the zone ready, ready to, to perform? Or do you not have many I rituals? I, I, don't, I don't know if I have like a set ritual. It's not like... McDonald's? Yeah, sure. I mean, food's food. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty lucky that my weight doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. But, um, I think for me, it's just staying calm. It's, it's not trying to get my... I'm already anxious enough. My heart rate's probably up, you know, 10, 20 beats from where it would normally be in a practice ride. So the last thing I want to do is kind of bounce around and get all excited. So it's more... Yeah. For me, it's trying to be calm and I'll, you know, I'll walk the shoreline, I'll talk to people, I'll just kind of try and trying to have fun and make light of the situation. And then <clears throat> for me, it's like, like you, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of losing. So I'm, it doesn't matter if I lose, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. You know, and I think it's kind of a weird thing to say, but by not being scared of losing, I feel like I'm more committed to win. Yeah. You know, I got I got nothing to lose, so I can I can always put it on the table. I've, you know, but, and that that's kind of my mindset going into it. But you know, bef 
the hours leading into the standing on the start dock and all that kind of stuff is just kind of walking up and down the shoreline, trying to see what's going on to see if there's anything weird. You know, kind of watch some of the other skiers and just, just try and be calm, not get freaked out. If some of the scores, some people don't ski as well as they should just yeah. kind of go for it. So that, uh, trying to just not have mm. anything to lose that mindset of going into it, kind of not afraid to fail that, yeah. I feel like that's, I, I remember you and I used to ski against each other collegiately back in 03, 04. And, yeah. um, and even the, the first, yeah, those were great times, right? <laughs> um, I remember though, even the Malibu open that you won the first, the first pro event you won in the U S um, you purposefully or purposely wanted to, to be early on, like in a final, for instance, you wouldn't want to be top seed. And at the collegiate nationals, you didn't want to be last out. Because maybe correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed like you wanted to be able to focus more on your game, and and how you wanted to to basically you know have none of these other things uh, on your mind. Like, okay, what do I need to to run to win? You wanted to be able to yeah. just go out and and ski your game. And I think that kind of plays into what you just said. Like having the ability to not worry about failing allows you to like let it all hang out instead of be guarded and tense and yeah. What? Yeah. I, I mean, I, when I, when I first started out, I, I used to get really hung up with how other people skied. Yeah. So it, it was kind of a real problem for me. And I, you know, it really bothered me if I, if I went last off the dock, I'd be so focused on what the other guys had done. I'd, I'd lose myself. Yeah. You know, I could, I feel like I was going to fall on my first path. So I, yeah, I, I kind of set myself up so I didn't have to go and put myself in that position very often. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk yeah. about Talk about this last weekend at uh, at the Cali Pro Am out here in California. The first round, guys weren't skiing that great. So uh, I know you went out and you didn't ski what you wanted to ski that first round. Um, yeah, which sucked because it was cumulative. So you needed a decent yeah. first round and second round. So I mean, how how much did that play into your performance just this last weekend, where guys were going out and not skiing up to their ability level, like skier after skier, and then you had to go out and try to forget about that. Was that, mm -hmm. did that play into your performance you think? Or were you not? It, no, I didn't, I don't think it played in at all. I, um, I was pissed off. That was annoying. I don't know. <laughs> 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 what can you say? I, you know, I, I got to practice there a couple of days. I went, you know, I came and skied with you the week before then. So yeah. I, you know, I skied your place and I got to practice a couple of days on the site with the, even with the boat driver and just, in that first round just did not feel like practice. It yeah. just felt completely different. I don't know if uh, there could have been a bit more wind in practice, so I didn't feel the rollers or maybe the, yeah. there was more skiing going on, but it, it just felt a little bit different. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't think at this point it affected me that much. I don't, I don't think what other people, were, what other people were doing was really yeah. affecting me. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Well, I disappointed myself with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that's, I mean, that's a tough part. You can talk about that too. Like we, we've both flown around the world specifically for an event. And I know this happens yeah. in other sports, but in our, in our sport, usually you get one shot. So yeah, maybe you could talk about the, like, what was it like going to the world cup in Russia and missing your, having them take your gates? What's that like? You fly all the way uh, to Russia. <laughs> Tell that quick story. Oh God! <laughs> you mean you mean the time it was we we're on the Volga River and it was a mile across and the wind was blowing from the other side, but yeah. they they sat us down in the meeting. And they said we can't homologate the course and the pre gates are in the wrong spot, but then <laughs> they still pull our gates. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it's a like it's a record capable tournament. Yep, yep. That time. <laughs> uh, yeah, that time. <laughs> yeah. Uh. That's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, but, but to, I mean, more to the point, like what do you, what mechanism do you use to deal with that? Cause like you could get pissed and like yeah. say F you to the sport and just leave and like not compete again. Yeah. But like, how do you get through that? You know, what, 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 what self-talk do you use to get to the next event and go in with confidence knowing that that could happen again, but you're going to do your best to go out and do what you do in training. I, I mean, I think, you know, we, we train a lot. We're, we're on the water a couple of, a couple of times a day, you know, five, six days a week. So we, 
you know, I ski different sites with different people, different boats, different drivers. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure my my average, you know, I have a kind of a running tally of my average of scores, and I don't know. I, I'm motivated because I know I can compete. Yeah. You know, I, I'm. I think I'm still in it. I'm still. Yeah. I'm still learning and that's, that's like the biggest thing for me now. It's uh, what can I learn about this sport? You know, I, I, I have these cool people around me that can push me in different ways, you know, yourself and Bob and Dave and just all these kinds of people that have a world of knowledge that can maybe say, Hey, you thought about it this way for the last 26 years. How about maybe try and think about it this way? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of what keeps me going. I do I have to do I have to compete? I don't I don't know. I kind of like trying to prove myself. I kind of like the camaraderie, I guess, some of the yeah. the feeling or the anxiety of being on the dock and knowing that you've got to put up a score or you know, that that stuff still definitely makes me tick. So that that's what keeps me going. I'm passionate about the sport. I put a lot of time into it. I believe in the people that are involved in the sport. There's a lot of really cool people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what that's what kind of keeps it alive for me. You said uh, we interview a lot. I get to interview you because I'm doing videos for HO. But you've talked, yeah, you talked a couple times, and I haven't got to really use this in any product video. But you talk about um, how empowered you feel to be able to develop a ski that you can go out and have your best performance on. But yeah. talk about the the bigger picture and how you you mentioned it many times how that tool that that ski can also go and give other people you know I mean that's yeah I don't want to put words in your mouth but you you said yeah, that no, it, it's it, it's really powerful and it's really for me it's really motivating too it's like I. There's, it's a pretty amazing what we can do to a water ski after it comes out of a mold. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff we can do in the R and D process to, mm-hmm. to create something that, um, I don't think there's anything that beats kind of going out in the field or, you know, like we go on these coaching days or, you know, maybe have a coaching week mm-hmm. and we see people on the ski and we see the enjoyment and the pleasure or the, the exhilaration they get out of riding the products. And that's, that's pretty cool. That's, I think that's something that, um, I don't think everyone gets to experience the, um, full cycle circle of life, I guess you can call it of the mm-hmm. water ski, mm-hmm. you know, from, you know, seeing it being built on CAD with Jeff and Dave, and then, you know, seeing it being manufactured with, you know, big Dave and then the guys in the press room making the skis. It's like, it's a, it's a pretty cool time, time consuming yeah. process. Yeah. You yeah, know, it, it takes it takes a while to get an idea from the from the head onto paper, and then to see the product and then you know test through it, kind of develop some fin settings that are going to be really good for myself and the general public. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's a long process, but it's it's really cool and really reward, rewarding. Yeah, it's it's got to be, but th- there's yeah. also got to be an element of balance. Like you you talked you told we and we and I we have talked about. Uh, Nicole, obviously, very integral part of your life, but she's <laughs> learned to drive the boat. She uh, obviously supports you in this endeavor, but um, you're also finding some balance, maybe. Like yeah. you used to used to be skiing was like, I mean, everything in a way, yeah. right? Yeah, I see. What? I mean, and, until I met Nicole, I'd say skiing was absolutely everything. There wasn't... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure if I was the nicest guy all the time, you know, I was pretty selfish, you know, I, but yeah, Nicole's definitely kind of showed me balance, but showed me there's, there's more fun to be had outside of skiing as, you know, as much fun outside of skiing as there is in skiing, you know, and it's, yeah. for her, she's really good about kind of bringing me back down or making me say, Hey, like you're so clouded by this. You've got to step back for a minute, Like you've got to, you got to step out of the fog. Let's go do something different or, Hey, let me help you work through this. Let me see you talk through it and stuff. You know, she's got a really keen eye to be able to work through that stuff, which I'm really thankful for. You know, yeah. Really supportive. Really. Do you think more, really cool. do you think more skiers could use that, that bit of balance? <laughs> Cause I mean, I'll just say yeah. it like, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I love, I love the ambition and the passion, but 
there are some some folks when we when I go do clinics or coaching that I feel like they're more amped about skiing than than I ever was. <laughs> And yeah. and I, I'm doing it for a living, so I mean, uh, not not to downplay or or you know rag on them, but is there a, yeah. need, a need for balance in in skiing to make it to get the most out of it? For sure, yeah, for sure there is. I mean, you you know, since I met Nicole, I've you know I, I do a bit of kiteboarding and we do quite a bit of snow skiing. We do like all these other activities that I never even you know I was never exposed to before. But yeah, I. I think I've learned more about myself doing these other activities than I ever have water skiing. Yeah. 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 I mean, in the, in the short time anyway, you know, it's like you can only be to, you know, you can only do the same thing for so long before you kind of run out of ideas or yeah. inspiration or, you know, even, you know, get into the CrossFit stuff. Like, yeah, that was her. That wasn't me. That was her. Like that was, that came from her side. But Hey, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. We've got to do something we can do together something that's not necessarily water skiing. You know, she loves water skiing, but she's like, man, I can't do I can't talk about it for so long. What other, does but, she, she talk about her toad water sports career real quick. She was, she was on the Canadian barefoot team. So she was like a, a badass barefooter. <laughs> she came fourth, fourth in the world. What? Um, yeah. What, like was her, she was, what was her event? Her events. She did, she did three events. Really? So they do slalom, slalom trick and jump. But I think she was strongest in tricks. Huh. And I would definitely owe it to her coach and someone I respect a lot. I think is Richard Gray. But he was super good about, you know, got to get the basics, you know. <laughs> and that's something she, she was always really good at. How come whenever I come to your house, she never barefoots? I've never seen her barefoot. She's retired. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? She's like 25. How old is she? I know. 26. Man, those barefooters, they take some wicked crashes. Oh, it, yeah. It, it's brutal. It's brutal, brutal. So when I when I first met her, she's taking all these crashes and she's getting concussions. I'm like, you know, you know, maybe you should think about wearing a neck brace or something. <laughs> so she she rocks over this tournament and all the barefooters are giving her a hard time because she's wearing a neck brace. I'm like, I don't give a crap. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's got to be that's got to be tough, man. There's a certain point where you can only catch a toe so many times, and then oh man, I I tried to barefoot, you know, I I tried to I tried to impress Nicole, yeah. So I my my barefoot career lasted about three weeks. Were you on the, the worst crash of my life? Were you behind the boat on the rope, or were you on the boom? Man, I was I was doing long line stuff. I was doing tumble turns and one yeah. foot and all this crazy stuff. Uh, and then I catch this worst toe scorpion in my life, and I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I'm out. <laughs> I retired. I don't need so, that. So anyway, you're you're taking hits on this long course as well, though. You're taking you turn. We turn hard. It happens. Yeah. You hang on to a lot yeah. of crap. What kind of stuff? You mentioned CrossFit. You mentioned McDonald's. Are there are there eat, <laughs> are there healthy eating habits that you try to focus on? Are there? Is it you know sleep? Is it what's the approach to to health and fitness to to stay on the water? What, what do you use? What kind yeah. of tips? Uh, me. Yeah, for me, it's all, um, it's about, it's about balance. So listening to the body, um, mm -hmm. try and, uh, mobility is really important. I think if you have tight seized up joints, you're going to have some pretty big issues. Yeah. I think food for me is just all about simple, clean, you know, if, if you can find clean, clean meats and fishes and, you know, wild fish is I think pretty important and mm -hmm. vegetables and just clean stuff. If it's, try and stay away from packaged foods and processed stuff and just, you know, kind of how your grandma would probably have cooked you know, back in the day. That's, how I, that's, that's a good, how I see it. It's a good way to put yeah. it. Yeah. You know, if, if the, if it's in the microwave, it's probably not good. But <laughs> it's pretty thin. I don't, I'm not, it's not like I'm, you know, I'm not like doing any hardcore crazy diets. I just try and eat clean and yeah. drink lots of water and, Get some That's sleep. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Lot of sleep's really important. Not a very good sleeper, but I know how important it is. <laughs> that's, that's the first step to recovery is knowing how important it is to be better. <laughs> yeah, I know. I wish I was better at it. I'm just not very good at sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, uh, I, I want to ask you a question. that's probably kind of weird to, to hear or answer, but, um, you know, there was, there was a time in our sport, uh, I kind of covered it in the the um, Paradise Lost flow point, but there was a time where water skiing was huge, 
It was on yeah. TV, ESPN, uh, Outdoor Life versus Net Network. It was on these TV shows almost every week in the summer. And um, at that time, there were brand, like household names that were dominating. There was Carl Roberts, Sammy Duvall, um, you know, obviously Wade Cox, Andy Mapple. I, there's, I could go on. I'm going to leave out a lot of people if I try. But yeah, yeah. after Andy and Wade kind of retired, like, early to mid 2000s it kind of was like will asher and jamie bushane battle like you guys were mm -hmm. the guys to beat perish a little bit but um since then like will asher in the last 12 years has made an impact what through your eyes what kind of legacy have you started to create or leave in the sport just based on what you were able to do on the water even though that is a very selfish endeavor like you said you do, there are some residual impacts. Like, I mean, I, I've seen them. Well, what do you, how does that make you feel to know that just by going out and trying to be the best in the world at something and succeeding at that, that you've changed people, changed the sport? Yeah, I guess, you know, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we kind of, we kind of go about our, our day to day, but, um, I think it's, I think it's really cool. I think I get a lot of people coming up to me and they're, you know, they say, you know, I, I look up to you or you're inspiring. You keep me going or, you know, whatever it is. But, um, for me, I, I just try and, you know, I, I want to be healthy. I want to be a good role model. I want to be, you know, those kind of things that maybe, you know, I, I guess maybe a good example. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that, I that's, that's really answering your question. No, I mean, that's part of it. But like you, you've uh, you elevating the performance throughout those years, you've made everybody reach more. You know, we talk about yeah. at an event, whether it's, you know, cricket or it's water skiing. If people aren't performing great, then that kind of has a residual effect and it changes the rest of the performances on that day. You're like it'll either bring everybody down or it'll elevate everybody up. So, yeah. And as soon as human beings see somebody go out and do something that everybody thought was impossible, that opens the floodgates. And I feel like does, you, kind yeah. of, you kind of helped open a floodgate in those mid to late 2000s to kind of get more people, you know, performing at the high level, running mid 41 off, running 41 it's, off sometimes. It's, it's amazing how the, the sports changed even in like the last five, six years or, you know, yeah. More people are running 41. I, I think when I first started, I was the seventh person to run 39 in a pro event. Hmm. And then yeah. it's like, holy moly. And now, it, you know, we'll have 30, 40 people do it in one event. It's just, yeah. You know, the, the sport yeah. has completely Evolved. changed and the, yeah. the level of knowledge and the technology and, the, you know, the equipment we're skiing on is just night and day from where it used to be. But um, What... Do you foresee a point where you're going to be like, what, what's going to be the deciding factor for you to say, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not, the, the pros aren't outweighing the cons, you know, cause you're healthy. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're still hungry. You're still learning mm -hmm. a lot about ski design and technique and like how, how much longer do you think you can be a part of this sport at the elite level trying to compete and be the best? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I guess it, it comes down to the body, doesn't it? It's like if, if the, the body and the mind is still hungry, then I don't see a reason to stop. You know, I'm, you know, if I'm still kind of winning events or being on podiums, I think that's definitely important to me. I don't, you know, I don't necessarily want to be, um, filling the numbers. I don't yeah. think that would probably do yeah. it. But I yeah. think, but, um, I haven't really thought about at what point you step away. I don't, yeah. I don't know what that would be. I don't, you, I didn't, you know, it's not even in, it's not even in my radar because I'm not ready to do it. Yeah. So I don't want to start yeah. opening the floodgates to, Oh, what's my exit strategy? You know? <laughs> Dude, I think a lot of people are stoked to hear that because yeah, you know, people have gone Jamie Boshane, you know, yeah. Drew Ross. Peaced like out. there's, there's One people. Year done. Yeah. Yeah. Well he, yeah, he peaced out. I mean, you see, we, we've seen, like, I was there last weekend watching you guys, and I start to see a lot of those old faces are gone. So, yeah. 
it, it's hard. So that that's why I bring that question up because a lot of people want to make sure that Will Asher is going to be competing and vying for championships for for years to come. I'm not going. You know, I, I think it's been hard. I think the sport's changed a lot. I think um, money's tight. I think for a lot of pe- for a lot of people yep. or a lot of industry, it's um, it's made hard to create the value for the companies or for the um, to to make a living. You know, a lot of people are like you know I got to go out. I got to support a family or I've yeah. I've got to support myself or you know whatever it is. I think people make those decisions and um, I think I've been fortunate. Maybe you know. I look back to, you know, being exposed to Andy when I was 16 and riding his ski, which I knew was phenomenally better than mine. Yeah. Or, you know, it wasn't even the same thing. I'm like, I got to figure this out. And it sent me down this path. And, you know, along that journey, I think that's created some value. And I think it's it's maybe, it's definitely given me more enjoyment in the sport beyond just being on the water. It's, you yeah. know, I can, you know, we can we can communicate together. You and I will talk about an idea. We'll, we'll build it or we'll you know, Dave will, can make something at the factory or whatever it is. And we go out and we test it and that's fun. Like that's that discovery, that learning. And it, you look at the, the top people in any industry or any sport, the, the guys that are at the top, the guys that are learning and they're doing the most innovative stuff. Yeah. You know, try, trying to bore into something. I think it's always going to be exciting. So even if I'm not able to reach the level I can today, you know, whether it's, a year down the road or 10 years down the road, I, I still see there to be a big place in the sport, hopefully where I can kind of park and keep learning. That's, yeah. that's the way I see it in my mind. I don't, I don't just want to be like, I'm out. You know? Yeah. You still want to be, be an integral part of the, of the community, which. Yeah. And I, and I'm, I mean, even in like the last year or two years, just, being able to be involved with maybe other people skiing has been really pretty exciting to me. Like, yeah. you know, getting to work with JT, you know, we, we do some stuff together. We ski together quite often and, you know, talk about ski ideas and, you know, some of the other guys in the team like Bailey Austin and um, all those people, Nick Adams, you, anyone that comes along, anyone that's passionate about the sport, let's, you know, let's go, let's do it. Uh, you, you were talking about Bailey and some of the younger kids uh, a week or two or go actually a couple months ago when I interviewed you. Um, yeah. What, what were they saying about your beard at the, fo- at the photo <laughs> shoot? <laughs> I don't know. They say, they say I touch it a lot. <laughs> they say that the average person touches their beard 700 times <laughs> a day. Uh, yeah. I'm like, there's no way I touch it 700 times. And I go like this about three or four times. Yeah. They're like, Oh yeah, that was like 10 right there. Man. <laughs> way over oh. 700 times. What, what's up with the beard? What's the history? What's the quick history? Quick how, history. How long um, have you been growing it? It's been a year. So this time, this time last year, what did we do? This, what were we doing this time last year? I left the California pro am, yeah. and Nicole, Nicole had to finish up some schooling in Calgary, so she did an extra semester in Calgary. So I decided I wasn't going to see her probably for a couple <laughs> of months, and I, I'm like, I'm I'll just going to shave. I'm not going. I'm not going to shave. <laughs> and then. And it kind of came in, and it, I didn't know if I could grow a beard or not. It kind of came in thick, and then it's winter, so I want to do the winter beard thing, <laughs> you know, going to the mountains and the icicles and yeah, yeah. And, and there, it, it just kind of kept growing. So here we are. Top top three beards in the sport right now. What, who are they? And you can include yourself oh, if you need be. Ma- Matteo Lazzari is Ma- Matteo. Matteo is probably he is number one. The professor, you know, <laughs> fellow fellow team HO skier. He actually, he's a very, very interesting dude. He came and stayed at my house for a, a few days and we had some very deep, deep conversations. He's a cool guy. Yeah. Very forward, uh, more, think, forward thinking. Very forward thinking. Yeah. He's, um, he's studying his PhD, I think, in sports psychology. So it's super interesting. Just to sit down and, you know, be able to work through a, maybe a couple of things I was playing with or even for him. I, I don't know. Maybe he got something from our conversations too, but it was. Yeah. Super cool. So he, he's definitely number one, man. He's been on it for a while with the beard. Yeah. Um, I just saw a picture. Yeah. I just saw a picture yesterday or the day before on social media of him. And he's in not he's not on Facebook, so I I, I think it must have been Instagram. It was it yeah. was wide. It looked like a Santa Claus beard. It, his, it was his really really yeah. comes out. like I don't, <laughs> I don't have the girth that he has. <laughs> and then uh I don't know, Nick um 
Nick Parsons came out the came out the blue, came out the woods. Uh, and hadn't seen that guy all year, and he just rocked up with this. <laughs> Definitely a pimp and beard at the Malibu Open, so that's pretty exciting. But, for him but he, that. but he trimmed it. He got all gun shy and trimmed it. Yeah, yeah overnight. He yeah, had over it. He had it. He had it. The ball spray deal in in um, Balacqua, Sacramento, and then the first round of the California Pro. I mean, shaved it. Like, I, was, <laughs> I was pretty. I was pretty upset, Nick. I'm going to tell you, I was pretty yeah. upset. I think he looked good with it. He's gonna listen to this, so yeah, you can tell him. You can tell him whatever you want to tell him. No, um, bring it back, man. You look good with it. <laughs> so, so uh, talk about uh, Mateo real quick. I was out in, in Florida hanging out with all you guys a year or two ago. I got to to you know Mateo was my chauffeur. I had no car. He's driving us around. Oh yeah. We talked yeah. a lot, and he mentioned he's like, it's like man, I got to tell you, uh, and he's pretty honest, pretty open. He's like, getting to hang out with you and Will Asher. He's like, I. I hope you know, he's like, I looked up to you guys when I was a kid and a teenager coming up. And he's like, I really, he's like, I really can't believe that I get to like have access and hang out and just be around you guys. And he wasn't saying it like trying to blow our ego up. He was telling me like, just so super appreciative, humble yeah. super humble. Like yeah. I didn't really know how to handle it. I was like, dude, I'm just me. I'm Are just you a guy. With yeah, no, Are I know you exactly. With me right now? <laughs> Exactly, and so so for him to get to like hang out with you and the team, and yeah, like I, I wish we could see him more. I don't know, I haven't seen him for a year. I know, I know he's in Europe. No, I, I I said that to, I think I said that to you, and I said that to Dave. I'm like, we got to find a way to plug this guy in because he's so yeah, he's a he's a professor. He's a, he's a prof he's the professor, man. He's a really interesting dude to be around. Yeah, I hope we get to spend more time. Matthew, come hang out. Come <laughs> hang, buddy. Come to Cali. Go to Florida. Okay, so he gets couple, mad at me that I, I I guess I pronounced his name wrong for his, the whole time I've known him. But he's like, it's Will Asher. What am I gonna, what am I gonna do? Correct him? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I think it's Matteo, and I call him Matteo. 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 Yeah. What are the other right. pitfall pitfalls of being Will Asher? Being somebody that people want to like hang out with because they think you're rad. Like, what are the other pitfalls? Like, they don't correct you when you pronounce their name wrong. What are some? Uh, uh, what are some? Uh, <laughs> What are some other <laughs> negatives to being Will Asher? <laughs> um, you know what's really what is actually really hard is to get people to to be critical of you. Kind of like yeah. kind of like that, you know, like yeah. when I'm skiing or, or hey man, let's feel free, pick me apart. Let's, let's say something. Yeah, about. don't be nice. Say, say something. It doesn't matter who it is in the boat. I mean, I'll I'll sit in the boat. I'll drive for them. They'll be coaching these people and blah blah blah, and then they'll get in the boat and watch me, and they'll just be silent. Like, <laughs> man, I want some of your knowledge. I want to sh share yeah. the wealth. So yeah, people, yeah. People, people tend. I think um, I'm a pretty quiet guy for the most part. I can be. Um, I I'm a bit of a deep thinker, I guess, and I think people take that the, the wrong way quite often. Yeah, yeah. They they maybe get slightly intimidated and don't really know how to break in to your to your shell. Maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, something like that. I've I've been told that quite a few times. But I'm like, don't take it personally, man. I'm just trying to figure something out. Or yeah, yeah. Not even, you know, just getting ready to ski. Or <laughs> I'm just doing. I'm just. I'm just being myself over here. You feel free to jump in. Yeah. Say something. Yeah. I'm happy to hang out. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, dude, I want to get maybe one more question, and then then I'll I'll let you uh, get back to to your Sunday afternoon. Um, Thanks. Real simple. Morning rituals. What, what do you what do you do every day in the morning when you wake up? That's kind of consistent to prime to prime yourself for the rest of the day. Or, or do you do you not really have any? What what's a what's a world champion morning look like? Uh, I wake up. I tend to wake. <laughs> I tend to wake up pretty early. So my my house is on the side of the lake. So I get the sunrise is the wake up call. So. You know, normally as it's coming nice. up, I'll, I'll normally beat the sunrise and I'll get to watch it. So it's, you know, wake up, have a coffee, kind of sit down, watch it come up. Just have a peaceful time in the morning before the chaos starts. So then I'll probably just, she'll do some yoga or whatever it is. And we'll just take it easy for a few minutes. That's kind of the morning routine. I don't You're know, I, you know, I, I listen to a few podcasts and some people are like, you know, like, I wake up and then I'll brainstorm for like an hour and then I'll, I'll you know, I don't think it's anything that intense. Take a so nice bath and, and face I, I could really, 
I could really throw some spanners in the work. What I do is I wake up and I go for a five mile run. <laughs> And then I come back and I eat beets. That's what you're just supposed beets. to say, just to keep people on their toes. <laughs> I know. Screwed up. That's what, every day I do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man. Well, um, uh, I had a couple more questions, but we're we're already 50 minutes in. I want to cut it cut it off, and we'll we're gonna get you back on again. Um, yeah. And uh, well, any questions? Well, I I don't want I don't want to keep this thing going, <laughs> uh, you know, too much longer. I mean. Um, I All think right, we've already yeah. talked about it enough, but uh, but we will bring Will Will Asher back on. Uh, it's been awesome, dude. Right. Thank you. I think for, I do better. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you have anything else you want to tell people at home right now, I'm good. First, first flow point podcast. Uh, I want to thank Will Asher. Anybody who listened, if you enjoyed this, or if you did not enjoy this, don't be shy. Send me an email. Be critical. Tell me what we can do better next time. Try to keep it long or shorter than 45 minutes, but I already broke the rule here, so. Willie, thanks for joining. Cool. Thanks, man. That was easy. Got any for- questions, fire them through Marcus, and I'm sure he can find a way to get back to you. Yep. Yeah, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a way for you to get a hold of me. And uh, if you want to ask Willie questions or leave comments, you can do that too. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, had a fun time with Will Asher. We're going to do more of these. And uh, take care, buddy. Talk to you soon. See ya.